World War One. Hello there, folks. Welcome to the First World War Part One. This discussion uh, here in January 2016 is going to look at the causes, talk about the causes of the war. Getting about a three-minute late start. Um, I found out I had a little window of opportunity where I could start, and I think John Walker said he wanted to join, so I invited him. He clicked on for a second. Um, I, I prefer to call to call it the World War Part One. And um, hold on a moment, just a second. Forgot my glass. Uh, okay, well, a lot of people know that there was a world war, a first world war from 1914 to 1918. Uh, what they don't know is really what caused it or um, much about it. And that's why this video is being made. Um, okay, I, I rather call it the World War Part One, and then the 1939 to 45 event, the World War Part Two, and then since 1944, I would like to call it the World War Part Three, which I think we're still in. But we'll go with the conventional terms: First World War, World War One, or as it was known originally, the Great War, and then later the World War. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, it was Francis Ferdinand got shot and then the countries started fighting. That's a simplistic view, so let's get going. The previous videos were about, you remember I made a series, uh, Nationalistic Chain Reactions in Europe, 1914, uh, 1815 to 1914. And that, that set the stage. Now that didn't determine that there was going to be a world war. That's not a guarantee. They could have, these countries could have avoided the war. And if you read Barbara Tuckman's book, The Proud Tower, she talked about what was happening in Europe in 1913, a year, exactly a year before the spark of the war, uh, July 28th, 1914. And the, the Europeans basically ruled the world on the eve of July 28th, 1914, and they could have continued to do that. And I'm not advocating imperialism, I'm just saying that was a fact. The United States, here comes the Kansas City Southern the, uh, Railroad, the United States of America was still, for the most part, a neutral country, a non-interventionist country, but um, with the influence of uh, New York City, uh, 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 industrialists and whatnot, Republican Party to a large extent, the United States began to get involved or get the itch for imperialism by attacking Spain, if you recall, in 1898, seizing the Philippines, Cuba, which was turned into a protectorate, the, uh, they, they weren't allowed to actually own it, uh, Puerto, Ric Puerto Rico and Guam. And we know that the United States would continue to follow that trend of the Eastern establishment or that influence of the Eastern establishment, New York City, the real capital, by going down the road to imperialism. And now we have the world uh, American sort of empire today, but all the, uh, you know, associated problems. We know that Napoleon was defeated in, in 1815 by a coalition of European powers. He was making an attempt to not exactly con take over Europe, but to, to a large extent control Europe, not gonna, he never even dreamed he was gonna control the world. He never was thinking along those lines. His greatest contender was Great Britain. They would determine that if anybody was gonna rule the world, it was gonna be them, not France, whether Bourbon France or Napoleonic France. And then we talked about how after the war, the things sort of settled down. <clears throat> the Russian uh, Romanovs proposed that maybe Europe would unite in what they called the Holy Alliance, would be all the reactionary countries opposed to any sorts of real changes, could, could team up and fight against any revolutionary activity, socialist, 
Masonic, et cetera, revolutionary activity. Uh, some countries signed on to this. The British were not uh, interested because, after all, they were a liberal country. They were largely uh, controlled by uh, Masonic um, forces, mostly York right and some, you know, of course, Scottish right too. But free and accepted masonry. But so they wanted to go down the road of what they call progress, but under the direction of Great Britain. And then as we see later, Great Britain and the junior part partner, their wayward child, the United States of America. Today, the senior partner in, in some ways or in most ways, but still they're joined together. And then we talked about all the rivalries that developed, but let's set the stage uh, July 20 uh, up to June. June 28th, 1914. So what do we have? We have Great Britain, which established a huge world empire. We, we should understand that they controlled one quarter of the world's people. By this time, they are self-governing colonies of Canada, that dominion that was established by Great Britain in 1867, Australia, New Zealand, Newfoundland, which is now part of Canada, The Union of South Africa, so those were the self-governing dominions. And then all the other colonies, the Empire of India, which was still under control of Great Britain, but they were moving it towards becoming a dominion. But that was a real difficult problem with all the internal uh, ethnic problems. Here's natural ice introduced in 1994, uh, I'm sorry, 95, nationally in 96. And, um, it. Um, we had the French Empire, which was also uh, growing, uh, really the second French Empire, because the first was New France in Louisiana, and that was lost. So then they were still growing, you know, the French Empire with the Caribbean islands and French Guyana and South America, which is still part of France today, not a colony anymore, part of France. They're African, they're growing African colonies. Algeria, which the northern part of Algeria was considered part of France. Uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia with French Indochina and the large Pacific areas of French Polynesia, which is still a French uh, overseas territory today, and some other areas. Also French territories inside of India, Yana on Mahe, uh, Pondicherry, which France actually held on to until 1954. We had the old Portuguese empire, which uh, was the first European empire. And they had uh, large African territories. They had lost Brazil because the, a member of the Portuguese royal family seceded from his own father and established Brazil as a separate country. And then the Portuguese Asian territories, Timor Island, um, Macau and China, which they held until 1999. A lot of people don't realize Portugal owned a city in China until 1999, 17 years ago. Well, really just 16 years ago as of uh, December 2015. And then Spain had a few little relics. They had mostly lost their territories and the, what they had was the rest of their territories were taken by the United States in that attack. Uh, so these, countries, you know, if you know about imperialism, they practice mercantilism. It was sort of a faulty idea. Their idea was that uh, it was based on this idea that there was a limited amount of money on the planet or a limited amount of wealth and that the only way a country could survive or compete properly would be to um, capture as much of the wealth as possible and build these huge empires and have internal trade and would have and make a huge sort of what we would call a commonwealth, meaning a country of countries, okay, an internally self-sustaining country of countries, naturally controlled by the mother country or some countries like France may say the father country. All right, the parent country. That's a faulty thing because um, as we know, countries can trade with each other internationally and they don't need to have empires and they could just make money anyway. Uh, and these empires turned out to be extremely expensive to rule. 
and it got to the point where you're spending ten dollars to make two dollars but um but at the time they thought this is the way to go and we are the white european countries we are superior that's what they're thinking so we have the best culture we have the right to take other people over other countries have that same viewpoint they just didn't either have the interest in taking over other countries or the ability china had the ability at one time they looked at going into uh, setting up African colonies, but there was no interest in it. They had no interest in taking over the barbarians, as they called them. Japan was very insulated, internalized country, a country that had no interest in imperialism. But the United States uh, <laughs> infected them with imperialism because what we know happened in this is very important to mention for World War I. In 1853, the United States Navy shows up in Japan and by the next year forced Japan to sign a trade treaty. And then the Japanese started to wake up and say, wow, look around. You know, before they were left alone and they didn't care of what happened to the rest of the world. But they, they see that China and other countries are being taken over piece by piece, in China's case, or like in Cambodia's case, they, the entire country taken over. So they became an, they developed an internal struggle in Japan between the old reactionaries, the shoguns. They're like, we don't need to change. We'll just keep doing the old medieval feudal, feudalistic system that we've had and never modernize, whatever. And then the modernists under the lead of the emperor saying, no, no, we've got to modernize or we'll be subdued by these, these white devils from Europe. We know in 1867, the Japanese emperor's faction won out. There was a revolution. The emperor, his faction regained power. And uh, they said, now the emperors will rule Japan again, not just in name, but in practice. What it turned out to be was really still in, in name only. But these modernists were working under the idea that the emperor was this absolute monarch. And we're going to modernize Japan. So that is what happened. Japan started a crash course in modernization from 67 onward. They sent students out all over the world to go to college and take not art, interior design, literature or poetry, fine arts. No, they were sent out to study the most advanced technology, shipbuilding and whatnot, you know, nautical uh, science military science and all of this. So very quickly, in about 30 years, Japan went from this internalized feudalistic country with practically no technology, you know, relative to the rest of the world, to this modern, technologically, you know, fairly technologically advanced country with a fairly strong Navy modeled on the British Navy and basically all their technology was stolen from other countries, fine, whatever. Then these European countries, the United States would be considered really a European country, just Europe and America. They start getting spooked because now, um, oh, here's this yellow threat. These Japanese are a threat. Well, if you'd have left them alone, maybe they wouldn't have been a threat. You like kick the ant pile. But anyway, when Japan attacked China in 1894 and there was the Chinese Japanese war little Japan busted up busted China up so bad that China announced they were going to modernize but they didn't they didn't really the royal family the Manchus the Qing dynasty they just continued to steal the money and China didn't really advance but Japan the appetite grows with the eating right so they ate they liked what they got. Now they get greedier. While Japan is growing, who is moving eastward from your Russia, right? The Russian Empire. They're taking over all of what, what is Eastern Russia today, Siberia. They start going into China and setting up colonies with the corrupt, weak Chinese government, and they set up Port Arthur. And Russia had this idea they're going to build a railroad across Manchuria as a shortcut to Vladivostok and then a connection to Port Arthur. And this sparked Japanese anger because they said, no, 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 we, we want to have influence in Manchuria. 
that's the area of China full of minerals. And you're going to try to edge in on our territory. And the Russians say, well, we have a deal with China. So, you know, buzz off. And that squabble continued. Then in 1904, Japan suddenly attacked Russia in a surprise attack or a sneak attack. They, the Japanese Navy just showed up at Port Arthur and immediately began to bombard the Russian Navy, which was caught off guard. <clears throat> they should not have been because the Japanese made many warnings that they were getting uh, like worked up. But whatever, the Russians were caught off guard. And then um, a big war broke out between the Japanese and Russian empires, you know, fighting. Japan got the jump on them, so they were winning in 1904, early 05. And that led to a lot of internal problems in Russia, which we're not going to get into. But then by the S05 went on, the Russians started to make moves toward the east. Japan was pretty much at their limit of what they were able to do. So they were very interested in having this peace settlement made. And that's when Roosevelt stepped in, Theodore Roosevelt, the United States. He wanted the war called off. So he was the neutral peacemaker there in Maine. They met in, oh, I'm sorry, in New Hampshire, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in a the Russian and Japanese signed a peace treaty brokered by the United States and the war was called off and the Japanese got half a Sakhalin Island. All the Curio Islands, they were able to take over Port Arthur from Russia and make it a Japanese territory, a naval base. And they get even more interested <laughs> in empire. The real reason Roosevelt jumped in is because he was very concerned that Japan could become a big Asiatic threat and he wanted it called off before it got bad. And so we know this because in 1907, the Americans' great white fleet went on a world tour and they made sure they stopped in Tokyo, these big modern American Navy ships, as a friendly visit to Japan. The real reason was Roosevelt wanted the Japanese to see, here's the U.S. Navy. It was like a veiled message, a veiled threat. Here's the U.S. Navy. You don't want to mess with this. The Japanese took it like it was meant to be taken as, uh, okay, you have a big Navy, you're making an implied threat not to mess with you. We got, you, we, we got, we got this. I mean, we you know we got the message. They weren't too pleased with the visit, but you know, they put on a nice face and said, oh, you know, beautiful ships. Very impressive. Um, Japan by this time had seized Korea and made it a colony, renamed Chosun. And they had seized Taiwan Island, or the Portuguese called it Formosa, made that part of Japan. So now Japan stretches from Taiwan Island down close to China, all the way up into formerly parts of Russia. Okay, so they're getting big and, uh, and scary for the US. Why, why are they scary for the US? Well, after all, the US has taken over the Philippines right below Taiwan Island and Guam right there in the Pacific, not so far from Japan. Not to mention that there was the issue with the open door policy in China announced by the United States in 1900, but actually developed by the British Foreign Office. Same with the Monroe Doctrine developed by Great Britain, credited to President Monroe. Okay, and John Quincy Adams. You say, what does this have to do with World War I? Well, a whole lot, it has a whole lot to do with it. Okay, going on. As these other countries are building colonies, you see now Japan, like I'm mentioning them, they're late to the race for colonies. So they're one of the have-nots. They don't have as much as they want, and they want more, and they're aiming to get more. Let's go back to Europe. Now we go back to Europe. Who are some other Johnny come lately to the imperial race? Well, we have Italy and Germany. Italy and Germany had no territories around the world because they didn't even rule their they didn't even have unified countries until the 1860s and 70s, okay? So Germany and Italy were divided into little squabbling states, independent states, until 1870. 
So there was no way they could set up colonies around the world. They didn't even have their own countries together. So by the time Italy and Germany get united in the 1870s, most of the prime cuts of meat, you know, the prime countries are taken up. But Japan and, I mean, uh, Germany and Italy go out there and start taking over territories, what's left in Africa. Mostly stuff people, other countries weren't interested in. The Germans did grab Togoland in, uh, in West Africa along the uh, Guinea coast. Cameroon, uh, next to uh, Nigeria. Uh, they also grabbed Southwest Africa, today Namibia, and East Africa, German East Africa, today Tanganyika, Tanzania, and uh, Rwanda and Burundi, Rwanda, Urundi, that area. Okay, so these are huge territories, bigger than Germany, and they were pretty lucrative for Germany. Italy didn't have too much. <clears throat> And it's not like they're going to go challenge Great Britain or France for territories because they would have a guaranteed loss in a war against those countries. So Italy had to grab, um, well, they attacked the Ottoman Empire in 1911, and they grabbed Libya. It used to be called Tripoli. Today it's Libya. It's right south of Italy. I mean, Li Libya and Italy are very close to each other. They attacked the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, Turkish Ottoman Empire. And they uh, seized Libya and the Dodecanese Islands, which are Greek islands, today part of Greece. And that was very successful for uh, Italy. And then they started putting there, and they also grabbed uh, Italian Somaliland, which is today Somalia. <coughs> and they had their eye on Abyssinia, today Ethiopia. Oh, well, they used to call it Ethiopia back then, too, but the operate, operative word at the time was Abyssinia. Abyss, you know, a bottomless pit. <laughs> that's like, that's like the, the name of the country, that land of the bottomless pit. It was so like obscure of a country. It's like you're going into a secret cave to go to Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Um, and then we have all these problems in Europe. Okay, so now in our mind today, 2016, we say, why didn't these European countries just cooperate? I mean, they had a lot in common. They're all the same race, white. They have generally the same religion, Christian. But I mean, you know, could be Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant, but they're Christian, right? They believe in Jesus. They have common culture, Eastern European and then Western European, but you know, it's European, more or less. You know, why didn't they all come together and have this big, non-warfare policy. Why did they have to compete? Now, we know that would have been the best route for all these European countries to say, look, we have these territories around the world. We don't need all these problems. And in some cases, they did cooperate, like with the Congress of Berlin and all that, but they generally did not cooperate. What they mainly did, and still do today, was conspire against each other and, and, and like, plot against each other. Look what's happening today with Western Europe against Russia, always plotting against Russia and then saying, you're so paranoid. Well, all we have is guns in your face. Why are you so paranoid? So this was the case back then. Everybody plotting against everybody. Okay, now what's the lineup? When Germany was established as an empire under Hohenzollern, under the Hohenzollern dynasty of Prussia, Berlin, in 1871. They were trying to figure out what to do. And they're not like Sweden, I mean, Sweden or um, Switzerland back then, you know, they're not going to think, let's just be neutral. They said, we need allies, you know. So they decided to um, team up with Austria-Hungary, their former adversary, but only an adversary because they were fighting over who's going to control Germany, not really anything else. And also the Russians. Now, Germany and Russia, if you look at a map, they were, con they were natural allies. Why were they natural allies? Well, they share a common border at the time. They both rule Poland, parts of Poland, which they didn't want to give up. So it makes sense that they would cooperate together so they could keep the Poles from rising up. And then Austria ruled southern Poland. 
so they would want to um, cooperate in that respect. Uh, all three uh, so they control ethnic groups who don't necessarily want to be controlled by them. Makes sense that they will cooperate. Another reason for them to cooperate, they had a common adversary, Great Britain. Great Britain had been picking with Russia, been picking on Russia since really 1815, when France was knocked out of the picture as far as being a threat anymore. The British start to have a bad eye toward Russia, like these guys are a threat. They're backward, they're not modern, but if they ever became modernized, they could be a threat. So there was a constant conflict between Great Britain and Russia all the way through. But in 1871, there's a new source of conflict, the German Empire. Germany was not taken seriously until 1871 because it was a weak confederation of squabbling states. No one saw them as any sort of threat. Now they do, namely the British. Why? Because once the Germans unified and started to march generally in the same direction under a common leader, the Kaiser or Emperor William the first and then Frederick and then William the second. The British became very paranoid because Germany very quickly became this industrial superpower. They were 1870s, 80s, 90s, early 1900s. They were the fastest growing economy in the world. Some of the greatest industrial innovations in the world were being developed in Germany. <clears throat> The British had the number one economy in the world. No one argues with that. But it was in a relative decline, okay? Compared to the other, you know, the British industry was old. Their industrial revolution was old. They had a lot of old equipment that was kind of in place and be so expensive to replace it. So they, they could see down the line that they would probably get passed up. And this concerned them so much. Not only does Germany modernize technologically and economically, they were very aggressive in their economic um, advancement. So they're, they've got agents all over the world promoting German, the German brand. British are really paranoid about this. Not to mention that, uh, it, that the Germans were also rapid, and this is where they made their terrible mistake. They were rapidly advancing in a military in a military sense germany germans were the germans were very quickly building up a huge land army the british say why 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 and a huge navy and now you know this was going to spook great britain who was the master the mistress of the sea with the greatest navy of all time so the british say hmm not good, not good. We don't need a big German Navy and we don't need a huge German land army. They're a threat. So they got their eye on them, but they still had their main eye, their main bad eye on Russia. Uh, well, let's jump ahead a little bit. 1899, a very bad war breaks out in what is today called South Africa. At that time, it was separate countries between the two Dutch countries, Orange Free State and the Republic of South Africa, or Transvaal, as people called it, and the British colonies of Natal and Cape Colony, uh, the British Empire. At the beginning, the Boers, the Dutch farmers, got the jump on the British, and they were defeating the British in different battles, like Amafa King. When the British were def you know, when the British in Blomfontein, when the British were <laughs> initially defeated, and uh, they were very brutal in their counterattacks. Now, no one can top Great Britain in lethality. They might cross their legs and drink tea and seem effeminate, but they really are the most lethal country on the in on the planet. And they don't hesitate to, as we know from history, to employ the most brutal uh, measures. And this is what they did in uh, South Africa. They couldn't beat the Dutch so so much on the battlefield, so they started going after Dutch civilians, rounding up all the rounding up all the Boer civilians, the women and the children, and sticking them in concentration camps, like packing them in like sardines and letting them just die out there in the heat. You know? So the Boer soldiers they couldn't stand to be up there fighting 
in their hit and run attacks, their guerrilla, guerrilla warfare, with, with all their women and children dying in these British concentration camps. So finally in 1902, they called the war off. You win, you know, you're going to attack civilians, we give up. And they, they went under the control of the British Empire. But the point is, with the initial victories in 1899, one, one country that sent a congratulatory uh, telegram to the Boers was the Netherlands. Congratulations on your great victory against the British. Well, the British don't care about the Dutch. They have an empire, but it's not strong, really, and they're no kind of threat. What really freaked them out was that the German Kaiser, the German Foreign Office, sent also a congratulatory note to the Boers. Congratulations on your great victory over the British. Now, the Great Britain says, you know, what the hell? <laughs> Why are they congratulating the Boers for defeating our armies? So then, at that point, the British say, okay, This is enemy number one. <laughs> now, I have a history book, and I don't know if it's this one, the new map of Europe from 1916, but it might be. I don't think it is. I think it's the other one. That, uh, yeah, that one about the all, all the state papers. I have all the state papers from uh, 1914 to 15. But what they stated in this book was that the underlying cause of World War I you know, the main cause of World War I, is how they stated it, was an underlying rivalry between Great Britain and Germany that went on for decades, okay? So the main reason they had a, a great war, a world war, was that there was an ongoing rivalry between the German Empire and the British Empire. Now, Great Britain, once they put Germany on their to take down list, they started to engineer things against Germany. Now, France also had Germany on their to take down list. France had been defeated by Germany in 1871 in the German-French War. <laughs> France had lost their territories, Alsace and Lorraine, to Germany, territories which they stole from Germany in 18, uh, uh, 1648, I might add. But anyway, you know, Germany says we want our land back. You stole it from us. We don't forget these things. So France had in their mind they want to get revenge against Germany. Revanche. The French were able, the French and the British were able to engineer getting the Russians and the Germans out of an alliance with each other, the old alliance of the three emperors, Austria, Hungary, Germany, and Russia. And they were able to get Russia into an alliance with them, Great Britain and France. Now, Russia, what does Russia have to gain? What does Russia have to gain from an alliance with Great Britain and France? When you think about it carefully, they have nothing to gain because they're being they're, they're join, joining an alliance with two countries that do not have their best interests at heart. And secondly, want you to help them defeat Germany, who you frankly have no animosity towards, nor you should you have animosity towards. So it's really a, a bizarre situation as the early 1900s developed. And then you've got William II of Germany. <clears throat> Not the best emperor. Patriotic, loves Germany. Sort of a, we're not going to go into a long psychological, you know, examination of William II, Hohenzollern, but uh, not the best guy to have in this situation. Kind of a hot-headed character. He says, the, the British are conspiring against my country. That's true, but your reaction is always like the worst thing. You know, your reactions are always like feeding into their conspiracy. So that what the Germans do under William II and his, you know, his other, you know, his prime ministers like Bethman Holv Bethman, um can't remember his second part of his name. Um, they 
they decide they're going to get into an alliance with Italy and Austria-Hungary. Okay, it's fine to be in, in, in an alliance with Austria-Hungary. They can't help you because this is a country that's never won a war in their history, basically. They're weak. <laughs> they have no sort of good navy. Their army is okay, remember, never won a war of any consequence. And then you're going to team up with Italy, in a country that is an arch enemy of Austria-Hungary. Why is Italy an arch enemy of Austria-Hungary? Well, they had formed their country, Italy, from basically seizing Lombardy and Venetia from Austria, and they have their eye on a third set of a third region called uh, uh, Tyrol, oh, and uh, Fayumi down in the southeastern uh, part, uh, southwestern part of Austria, northeastern Italy. But they're going to team up. <laughs> they're going to be allies. Italy and Austria, two countries that practically hate each other and have nothing in common except they share a common border, but they're at each other's throat. So imagine how well this alliance is going to work. Now, Italy, a country that cannot help you in a war. They have a navy. It's okay. They have an army that's suspect. Uh, they have never won a war on their own since, uh, you know, the Battle of uh, Chalon in the 400s when the Roman Empire teamed up with the Germanic tribes to defeat the Huns. Okay, not a good track record. So here's Germany, this up-and-coming, potentially very great power, teaming up with two countries that are not a list not a list teams okay the british team up with france credible not the best does doesn't have a great track record in warfare frankly but they're a serviceable ally for great britain now what does france have to gain from joining an alliance with great britain well you know if you think about it carefully not a whole lot they might get revenge against Germany, then it might not work out. Maybe their country will be terribly ravaged. Hell, if France would have had good sense, they'd have said, you know what, we lost those two territories to Germany, let's write it off. Let's just forget it. Let's just be allies with Germany or friends with Germany. But these countries don't think this way, you see. They can't just, uh, write off a loss and forget it. No, 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 no. They got to get revenge. So the British manipulate France into becoming their junior partner. And they manipulate Russia into withdrawing from the German alliance, which could have helped them, into joining an alliance with them, which puts Russia in extreme danger. They've been attacked by France. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, Japan. And now... We have this situ uh, situation where we've got this entente cordiale, this sort of informal alliance between Great Britain, France, and Russia, which everybody knows about. It's not necessarily a formal alliance, but it's an understanding, and we all know what that means. Everybody in Europe knows what it means. And the triple alliance, Germany, Italy, Austria-Hungary. And then all your neutral countries like uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, Norway, who don't want any, they don't want any part of this because in their view, it's insanity, you know. Now we have this terrible, and then we have the Turks, the Ottoman Turks. They don't want to, they don't want to be in an alliance with any European country because what, what advantage is that to them? Why do they care if a bunch of Christian or nominally Christian countries wipe each other out? It doesn't matter. Then they're trying to hold on to whatever empire they have left and it's not doing so well. I'm going to get some more water and then I'm going to come back and we're going to lead up to uh, July 28th. So um, let's go on. So we, we have a series of crises that break out. And when you look at these crises, you have to laugh to yourself, like, these people must be crazy, you know, like, uh, here's Morocco, okay, Morocco, nominally a part of the Ottoman Empire, 
but in reality, not at all, and hasn't been for the longest time. It's an independent sultanate in Northwestern Africa, a Muslim country that basically just wants to be left alone. But that ain't gonna happen in the early 1900s. Somebody's coming to get you. And who are those people? Well, who is right north of Morocco? Spain, and then right up the road is France. So they've got their eye on Morocco. And if Spain and France have their eye on you in 1908, they're going to take you. No big deal, no big deal at all except that Kaiser William II's got this idea in his mind that he wants to make Germany this great world player, this player in the world. Well, that's just great. That's about the last thing Germany needs to be doing right now is making themselves a player in the world geopolitical situation. But that's what they do. 1908. Here goes the Kaiser visiting the Sultan of Morocco. German battleship arrives in Morocco. The Kaiser has a meeting. Now the French throw a fit because they see it as an attempt by the Germans to intervene in the French attempt to annex Morocco. And it sets off a crisis which almost leads to a war between Germany and France. France starts to threaten to go to war. Another crisis breaks out in 1908. Bulgaria declares independence, which is an illegal act under the treaty, <coughs> the Berlin Agreement of 1878. They declare independence. No one in Europe says a word about it. Like, oh, well, who cares? The Austrians say, wait a minute. If it's OK for Bulgaria to break this convention, then that means the convention is null and void, and we're breaking it. Of course, we can't break it if it's null and void. So Austria, the next day, immediately announces that they are annexing Bosnia-Herzegovina, an area that Serbia had wanted in southeastern Europe. <clears throat> you know, and now it's a big issue now, you see. People say, oh, Austria-Hungary, you should not have annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. The agreement was that you just control it, but not own it. But the Austrians, the Habsburgs say, well, when Bulgaria declared independence, it was like, no comment from anyone, so we're going to do that too. And this sets off a, a big crisis with Serbia. Here's a map of Europe. Look at this map carefully. This is 1914. You see Bosnia-Herzegovina, Albania, Greece, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, <clears throat> They didn't know what to do with Albania. Everybody wanted it. What they decided to do with Albania was say, okay, the Turks can't have it, but neither can anyone else. So they created Albania as this independent little Muslim European country. They're Europeans, but they had converted to Islam. So it's the only European Muslim country today, then and now, unless you count Turkey as a European country and no one really does. So they're like a little neutral country to avoid a war. No one wants to fight over Albania. Okay, so that solved, sort of solved that problem. And I talked about this in the last video, a rivalry developed in, in Southeastern Europe between Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, over the Turkish territories, which they were kicking the Turks out of Europe and then they fought against the Turks and won in 1912. But then they said Bulgaria grabbed too much land and so then they had another war in 1913, the second Balkan war between Bulgaria versus Serbia, Greece, and uh, Romania. And then Turkey jumped in to grab back some of their land that they had lost. So there's a lot of tension in Southeastern Europe. The main area of tension in Southeastern Europe <coughs> was between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. Why is that, you may ask? I'll tell you why. Serbia, an Eastern Orthodox country, generally allied with Russia, because after all, Russia has the same religion, Eastern Orthodox, 
similar language, Slavic. And thirdly, Russia was the reason Serbia was independent because the Russians attacked the Turks and that's how Serbia got their freedom. So they are oriented toward Moscow and St. Petersburg. Then we have Austria, a Catholic country who has designs on, you know, grabbing as much land as they can in Eastern, Southeastern Europe. And they had taken Bosnia Herzegovina because they wanted it and to block Serbia from having an access to the coast. So they want Serbia to remain landlocked. They don't like Serbia. They don't trust Serbia. Serbia, they know. What does Austria know about Serbia? They know that Serbia wants to create their own empire, a South Slavic empire, which the Serbians want to call Yugoslavia, which would be under the control of Belgrade. It would be a Serbian empire controlling Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, Northern Greece, Croatia, and Slovenia. Croatia and Slovenia belong to Austria. No one argued that point. So they don't like each other at all. What is the position of the rest of the European countries? Frankly, they don't care. They don't care if Serbia and Austria wipe each other out. No one wants to die for that. There's only one country that's interested in that imbroglio. And that's Russia. Russia. Why is Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, and frankly, Greece, why are these countries even independent in 1914? Well, it's because Russia invaded and attacked the Turks and helped these little countries break off. And they all look to Russia as their savior, right? Like the great empire of friendship, you know, their great friend. Okay. And they look at the Turks as their great enemy. But by 1914, the Turks are nowhere, going nowhere quick. Uh, a few more little details. The Germans, and remember, the Germans are very aggressive in their growth, okay, which freaks the British out. They had this idea they're going to build a railroad from Berlin to Baghdad in the Ottoman Empire. Baghdad, as we know today, the capital of Iraq. The Berlin to Baghdad Railroad. And then there will be a, they'll build a, another uh, spur to um, Kuwait, the city of Al Kuwait, part of the Ottoman Empire. And there'll be a German trade route from Berlin in Central Europe all the way to the Near East, Iraq, close to the Middle East, Iran, Persia. Well, this is a great project because now the British, the, uh, the, the, the Germans can have this huge trade area. <laughs> you know what's going to happen there. Okay, so um, here's your situation. <laughs> like I should have graphics, right? But um, you know what I mean? Like, um, there's Europe, and they're going to build a railroad from Berlin up there in the orange country. And as you can see, at that time, Germany stretched from France to Russia and from Denmark down to Switzerland. And there's Berlin, and the, I mean, there's Iraq. Whoops. <laughs> there's Iraq uh, down here where my pinky finger is. The Berlin to Baghdad Railroad. Once again, the British get the jump on Germany and they are able to take control of the city of Al Kuwait and take control of this little area, which they call Kuwait, a British, not a colony, but a territory under the control of Great Britain. Kuwait, okay, Kuwait. When was Kuwait ever a country? Oh, well, it never was. But it is now. The Germans say, damn nation. The British took over Kuwait, and that was going to be the end of the railroad line that was going to give us access to the Arabian Sea or the Persian Gulf. I mean, the Arabian Gulf or the Persian Gulf, however you call it. Most people call it the Persian Gulf. The British say, oh, well, oh, boy, you're, me you're messing with the master, you know. 
So now it's almost pointless to build the Berlin to uh, Baghdad Railroad without the access to the Persian Gulf, but they're going to still work on it. <clears throat> so we have the crisis in Morocco that almost turns into a war. Well, what happened there was they negotiated that Morocco would become a French territory and northern Morocco would become a Spanish territory, Spanish Morocco, and part of Morocco is still Spanish today. Suta and Melilla, two Moroccan territories still under control of Spain in 2016, by the way. And what is Germany going to get out of this? Uh, they're going to make some adjustments down around Cameroon and down by Southwest Africa to give Germany some territory for not, you know, for kind of like getting the snub in Morocco. Okay. So France is mad at Germany, and Germany's mad at France, and Russia is mad at Japan, <clears throat> and Austria is mad at Serbia, and Great Britain is trying to control the world, and they're mad at Germany because they're getting too big. And they are obviously not going to cooperate with the idea that Great Britain is going to run the show. See, that's the problem. They're not going to do like France under Napoleon III and the new Third French Republic, who was pretty much willing to let Great Britain take the lead. Germany is pretty obviously going to work as an independent agent. They're not going to be anybody's puppet. And that's where the problem comes in. It's like Russia today under Putin. They'll be friends with the United States and Great Britain, but they are obviously not going to go along with this idea that they're going to be uh, a second player in the American-British well, control of the planet. They're going to operate as an independent agent. Well, you know, that just cannot stand. We cannot have that. That's a threat, <laughs> right? So that's why Putin is a threat, because this guy wants to do his own thing. How can you have that? And here's great. Here's Germany. They want to do their own thing. I mean, these people are dangerous. They think for themselves. We can't have that. We got to take these beer drinking, sauerkraut eating people down a notch or two. So that's where the extreme danger comes in, this underlying conflict between Great Britain and Germany. What would have been Germany's best option? Well, looking back 100 years, just to say, forget it. Let the British rule everything. We can have our own country. We don't need a great navy. We can have an adequate navy to protect our colonies, which honestly, no one was trying to take from them. Not only did they have the African territories, but Germany also controlled northeastern New Guinea Island, the Bismarck Archipelago, the Solomon Islands, which you know are out there in the Pacific Ocean, the Caroline Islands, and the Marshall Islands, a huge Pacific territory, set of territories, areas inside of China, We Wai, a Chinese city controlled by Germany, and these massive African territories. That would have been their best option. Just let the British run the show. We can still make our money. We don't have to be an independent agent. I mean, we don't need our day in the sun, as they called it. There's no really, when you think about it, we're thinking about it in 2016, there's no real point to it. You hear what I'm telling you? Germany, the Hohenzollern Empire of Germany, the Second Reich, they, did, they didn't need their place in the sun. The British have their empire. It's their expense. Let them deal with that. But it's not the way they think in 1914. They think they're picking on us. That's how the Kaiser and his people are thinking. They're picking on us. And now don't ever think the Kaiser was in full control of Germany. Germany was a constitutional monarchy which, if you study it carefully, was more democratic than Great Britain. So the people had more influence in the government. They had a house, a lower house and an upper house and a court system. OK. You know, if you look at the propaganda during World War One, the Germans are portrayed as some kind of like, you know, you know, this empire with an emperor who's got real power and he's like this tyrant who tells everybody what to do. That is not the case. Yeah, nominally, he was the head of the armed forces. Nominally, he was the chief executive. And he used to like to act like he ran everything. 
in reality, he was to a large extent ignored by the German establishment who looked on him as a goof and reckless. And, uh, you know, they would say, okay, all right, <laughs> you know, whatever you're saying to us, we understand your highness, your majesty. They would pretty much do what they wanted. So uh, he was not this great emperor. He was the head of state who was, who had some influence in the German government. The main influence was the German uh, foreign office and um, the prime minister and the Reichstag, the parliament. In Great Britain, they had King Edward VII, 1901 to 1910, and then George V, who did probably have more influence, well, who certainly had more influence in the operation of the British government than the German royal family. Now, I'm not saying that the Kaiser didn't have influence in the operation of Prussia, the kingdom of Prussia. He was the king of Prussia. Yeah, okay, but for the whole German empire, I don't think, I don't think that's the case. And, and a lot of people would agree with that. Whatever the case, internal government of Great Britain and Germany, they were rivals and they had it in for each other, especially the British had it in for Germany. We're going to wrap this up with saying what happened? What happened? Okay, Austria-Hungary had the same emperor since 1848. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Francis Joseph Hohen's uh, uh, Habsburg was the emperor of Austria, the king of Hungary, the king of Bohemia, we call that the Czech Republic today, since 1848. <laughs> okay, so in 1914, he is a very old man in his mid 80s. Everybody knows he's not gonna be around. His wife is dead. His, he has no descendants. His child was dead, supposedly by suicide, his son. But he has a nephew, a great nephew, actually, Francis Ferdinand, who is the next in line to be the emperor. And then his younger brother, Charles, is the next in line after him because Francis Ferdinand married a woman in a morganatic marriage who is not allowed to inherit any of the titles. Her children cannot be future emperors. He was in love with her, but she wasn't royal enough, so that could never develop. In other words, his if Francis Ferdinand became the next emperor and king, king and emperor, his, his lineage would stop there as far as uh, being in power. Then his younger brother Charles, or in German Karl, would be the emperor after him. Okay, so Francis Ferdinand is the heir apparent, and he knows that he's going to be the emperor soon because this old man, Francis Joseph, is not going to live forever. Francis Ferdinand is very concerned because of the situation in Austria-Hungary, this German country that controls these non-German people who aren't necessarily delighted to be under their control. He's got a problem with Serbia and the Slavic people, but Francis Ferdinand wants peace, and what he wants to do is create a tripartite empire. Now, how did he ameliorate the problems with the Hungarians? Well, in 1867, they cut a deal with Hungary that they could have their own empire the Kingdom of Hungary, and they would recreate the empire as the Empire of Austria and Hungary. And Hungary was very satisfied that they could rule their own empire and have virtual independence within the empire, and they were just delighted. So that solved the problem. Well, they wanted to do that with the Slavic people. He wanted to create a new Slavic country, which he, would, he was going to call Yugoslavia, South Slavia. He would be the king of it. But in practicality, and you know, in a practical sense, the Slavs would have their own parliament, their own flag, and their own internal self-government. And he knew that would make them happy. Serbia could not go along with this because they wanted to control the area. And the idea of the Serbians was, hell, if there was going to be a Yugoslavia, it was going to be under their control. Their control. All right. <laughs> and we talked about this in the last video. He's going to travel to Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, in 1914 to try to work, start working out this agreement to set up Yugoslavia and create the new empire of Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia. Some people advised him not to go there. They say, look, Sarajevo is a very dangerous place. There are Serbian terrorists operating down there. 
it's not the place to go. He said, but it's part of our empire. I mean, if I can't go to my own country, you know, what do we have here? So he and his wife and their entourage go down there. Sophia, they left their kids in uh, Vienna. We know what happened. They were murdered by a gang of youngsters, teenage, late, you know, 17, 18, 19 year olds, Gavrilo Princip, the gunman, on the streets in Sarajevo. Princip is not shot and killed. He's arrested and taken into questioning. And after Austria gives him that special Habsburgian uh, interrogation that they give him, they find out, and they knew this already, that there was a cell working inside the Kingdom of Serbia, probably supported by the Kingdom of Serbia. Gabriel Princip, only 17 years old, or 19, depending on which source you read, but a teenager. So Austria says to Serbia, well, that's it. <coughs> you screwed up. No big deal. But you're going to pay. Now, this is going to spark the crisis. The crisis is already in place. You understand? I said this is going to spark the crisis. In other words, it's going to light the fuse. The fuse is there. The gunpowder is in the keg. It's going to light it. And what do they say are the main causes of World War I? The main causes, you know, we get this from the high school history books. Main, M, militarism. These countries are all militarizing. They want the biggest army, the biggest navy, the most modern technology. That's wonderful, but it's a terrible arms race. What's the benefit? Alliances. They think that if they make alliances, it'll keep them safe. When in reality, the alliances put them in grave danger. Because now you got to go die for somebody else who does not have your best interests at heart. Imperialism, which I just talked about, this rivalry to control the whole world. Bad idea. <laughs> and nationalism in nationalism. All the little ethnic groups want their independence. And look at all the trouble that's been going on since 1815 with all the little nationalistic groups want their independence. Wouldn't really matter, except that the big European countries control them and they always want to conspire against each other to uh, get an advantage on one another due to this imperial, uh, this nationalistic uprising, you see. <coughs> There's really a fifth cause, this revolutionary activity from socialism and um, Freemasonry that had been going on, you know, all throughout Europe. It's not really a cause of the war, but it's an underlying, like, contributed contributor to tension and problems within these countries, you see. We're going to end this video now, but the next one, part two, if you're interested in seeing it, what happened subsequent to the murder of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife, Sophia. You can imagine it set off a crisis of the highest order in Austria-Hungary, okay? a crisis of the highest order. The government of Austria-Hungary placed the country on the highest alert. And after those two people were murdered, it was like in the movie Casino, you just know somebody's getting clipped. There's no doubt about that. Great Britain, France, Germany, uh, Russia, Italy, and the whole rest of them, they don't question that. They know that if the Archduke and his wife are murdered, somebody's getting clipped. I mean, because that's how Great Britain always operated. You kill Lord Mountbatten in 1979, okay, not a problem. A whole lot of people are gonna die in a, in a, in, in a most gruesome way. <laughs> you understand, when the IRA killed Lord Mountbatten in 1979, the British, you know, they're gonna drink sherry out the little glass and have the tweed jacket. But there's a whole lot of people gonna, walk, gonna wake up dead in the morning across Ireland and other parts of the world. I mean, that's going to happen. That is part of how that is going to work. So that's not really the contention there that these two people are murdered and a whole lot of people are going to get clipped. That's not the contention. The contention, the problem is that who's going to get involved with the fallout of it? 
that's where it's going to turn into a really bad situation. Okay, thank you for watching the video, and I'll be interested in your feedback.